Ahoy, and welcome back to Lay's Library. Find yourself a cozy corner, get yourself a cozy drink, and let's get started. Today we are going to be looking over all of the books that I read in October of 2022. Uh, yeah, that's about it. Let's get into it. So, the first book that I read was Wondersmith, The Calling of Morrigan Crow by Jessica Townsend. Oof, I almost said Jennifer again. This is a middle grade fantasy fiction. It is a sequel to Nevermore, The Trials of Morrigan Crow, in which a girl named Morrigan Crow is a cursed child and she is fated to die on her 11th birthday, but when her 11th birthday comes around, she is um, whisked away to a magical, whimsical world called Nevermore by an enigmatic and mysterious man named Jupiter. Um, and it is, I just, I love these books so much. Um, I love this book just as much as I did the first one. The whimsy and the charm is still right there to give you the warm and fuzzies. Um, but mingled with that is this story of Morrigan still dealing with the trauma of having been seen as a curse for most of her life and having to fight against the prejudices that are still following her. Um, a little bit because of that and also for a lot of other reasons now. Um, it's just such a beautiful story. It's full of such delightful and vibrant characters and I love it so 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 much. The one thing I will say is that I do wish the reveal at the end had been foreshadowed more. Um, like I wish there had just been little like more hints of it throughout the story. Maybe there were and I missed them but I don't think so. Um, but yeah, that's that's it. That's my my one critique. I just love the writing of this book so much. There's so many things that just ring so true, and even if they're mundane, like I'm gonna read this passage um, that just really struck me because Morgan has never really experienced a, what a family is like, and she's never really known love, and now she she has, and. Uh, it's just, I just love it so much, so I'm gonna read this little passage. It's not very little. Because even if the rest of the world was suspicious of her, Jupiter never would be. He believed her. He trusted her. There were things she was dying to tell him, things she'd been dying to tell him for weeks. But now that Jupiter was here and she had his full attention, those things didn't seem so important. She was happy just to finally have him back, and there was a whole list of other things she wanted to tell him instead. Jupiter listened closely to every word, and reacted exactly the right way in exactly the right places, and it was all so familiar and so comfortable, so reassuringly normal, that the question Morgan really wanted to ask, the questions that had been burning in the back of her throat, threatening to burst out of her mouth like dragon fire, burned itself down to ashes before she could find a way to ask it. She swept it into a quiet corner of her mind and let it sit there, ignored and unanswered. And if she ignored it for long enough, Maybe it wouldn't be important anymore. Maybe it would never be important again. Maybe the question could sit under the pile of ashes in her mind, safe and quiet and unimportant, forever. And like that passage just just hit me because she, the question she needs to ask is a very important one. But she just wants, she just wants to enjoy the love of her parental figure that she's never experienced before. And I get it. And that's so. Ow! <laughs> it hurts, but it's so good. <laughs> so yeah, I gave it 4.5 out of 5 stars. I took 0.5 off for um, the end reveal not being foreshadowed enough, and that's that's the only thing. So for the rest of October, I tried to focus on reading spooky books since it was spooky season. Um, and those could be spooky in terms of horror or like thriller, like more realistic thriller. So I started with The Silent Patient by Alex Michalidas, which is a mystery thriller that I've heard talked about a lot and there seem to be mixed reviews about it, but it was recommended by a friend of mine, so I decided this would be the perfect time to start. This is about uh, a famous painter named Alicia Berenson, um, who lived a seemingly perfect life. She was a very successful painter. She was married to a very well-known fashion photographer, and they both were well off and in love. Until one day when Alicia shoots her husband five times in the face, 
and then never speaks a word again. Six years later, Theo Faber, a psychotherapist, is determined to get to the truth behind the mystery of why Alicia killed her husband all those years ago. So, interesting premise, was definitely on board with it, but right away the writing just really didn't do it for me. The author was clearly trying to build suspense, but he did it in a way that felt very forced. Just like writing things like, if only I'd known that... But wait, I'm getting ahead of myself. And yeah, it just it just didn't work for me. Overall, I found the writing nothing is nothing really spectacular. Um, but I hated the characterization of Alicia. Um, I hated that she was often described as childlike yet also seductive. Um, pardon my language, but fuck that. I'm so tired of that. That's something that we can absolutely stop immediately and never ever do again in any form of media. Um, and I, if it had just been the narrator, or like the, the main point of view character is Theo, so if it had just been him narrating or like describing her like that, it would have worked because then it just would have been his point of view and I already disliked him, so great. But no, it was it was everyone. Other therapists and people at the clinic also use the same words to describe her, and it's just gross. And similar to Wondersmith, actually, I just wish that there had been more hints about the big twist reveal throughout too. So for a twist to be effective, you have to be able to look back at everything that's happened and go, Oh, that makes so much sense. Of course that's what it was. But my thought was, oh, does that? Yeah, I I guess that makes sense. And there was also a big part of it that was just too coincidental for me to wrap my head around. Um one thing that I will I I did hmm. So there's one thing that I keep going back and forth on and that is the main character. So right from the start, I didn't like him, and I think that was intentional, but I'm not sure. Um, so I'm going to give the author the benefit of the doubt and say it was. So I'm going to give th say that is a point in this book's favor, where from the very beginning something felt off to me about him. So yeah, uh, overall... Unfortunately, this was a 2.5 out of 5 for me. Just not for me. I've, I have read better. But this was also a first novel, so I think the author still has um, a lot of potential. So, all the best to him and his future endeavors. Next up, I read The Hacienda by Isabel Cañas. This is a gothic horror. So, after the overthrow of the Mexican government leaves her and her mother devastated and forced to stay with relatives that hate them, Beatriz finds her escape when the rich Don Rodolfo Solarzanzo proposes to her, offering her security, stability, and a countryside estate that he owns. Ignoring the whispers and the rumors about his first wife's demise, Beatriz marries him, but the estate is not the sanctuary Beatriz imagined, Whispers follow her, phantom hands reach for her in the dark, but nobody's willing to listen to Beatriz. The only ally she can find is in the form of a controversial priest named Andres. So this is very reminiscent of Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier, and I love Rebecca. Um, I'm thinking maybe I just wasn't in the right headspace for this book, because I didn't enjoy it as much as I thought I would, but I don't actually think, but I don't think it's Bad. I don't think it's the book's fault. I think it could have been shortened a bit, um, and I wish some things had been built up more, which is a running theme for this October's books, I guess. Um, but that's about it. So I don't know why I didn't enjoy it more. Um, the history of the time period is woven throughout the story, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and it's just enough to like add an extra layer um, to the story without being overbearing. It's not just like a bunch of information thrown at you, it is woven in very nicely. Um, and I thought Beatrice's character was very compelling. 
She's just trying her best to make sure that her and her mother are safe in a rapidly unsafe world, uh, no matter what sacrifices she has to make. And I really did feel for her, and I understood why she was doing these things. She's just trying to survive. I would recommend it if you're looking for a haunted house story or a gothic horror story, or if you liked Rebecca, um, but wished Rebecca had a little bit more of a paranormal hint to it. This is that. <laughs> so I gave it three out of five, but if I reread it in the future, it might be higher. Definitely wouldn't be lower, but it might be higher. But for now, it's a solid three out of five. Next, I read House of Hollow by Crystal Sutherland. This is a YA fantasy horror. This is a story about three sisters who mysteriously disappeared um, as children, only to come back a month later with no explanation found. They never discovered who had taken them or where they'd gone. Um, they don't remember anything that happened to them. They just showed up one day in the same spot that they were found, except they came back a little different. Um, their hair and eyes changed color, and they're just overall very strange. And the book picks up when the eldest sister once again mysteriously vanishes, and the two other sisters set out to find her, and in order to do so, they'll have to unravel the mystery from their childhood disappearance. I love this book. <laughs> <laughs> this was probably my favorite book of the month. It was, I enjoyed it so much. I thought it was so good. First of all, writing, beautiful. Loved it. It was just so brilliantly written. The in information is unraveled bit by bit, just at the right times. And so you start by learning of, say, a one particular event that happened, and it's presented to you just like, oh, this happened. And then later you learn more details and realize that it actually happened quite differently than you initially thought. And then you learn more details that completely circumvent how you initially thought the event happened. And it was just so brilliantly done. I don't think I'm doing justice by explaining it the way I am, but just like the tiny little bits of information you're given throughout that just contextualize everything you learn at the beginning. It's just so good. <laughs> the horror in this, uh, in my mind at least, is really subtle but so excellent. It's like a paranormal horror mixed with a tiny bit of body horror. And I normally hate body horror, but I thought this was done really well and it didn't make me want to blind myself. And the horror is just, I almost hesitate to call it horror, but I don't know what, what else it would be because the horror is more like, it's eerie like so much in this book is just so eerie and it's like it's something that could be totally normal but you're pretty sure it's not it's like uncanny valley levels of eerie and i i i, oh, I loved it so much it was so ah oh, i just really liked it <laughs> i don't want to say too much about it because i don't want to spoil anything but i highly recommend if you're looking for an eerie, creepy mystery. Yeah, I gave it five out of five stars. Next up, I read Life Without Ed by Jenny Schaefer and Tom Rutledge, um, which is a nonfiction self-help book about one woman's experience detailing how she managed to overcome her eating disorder. I picked this up because it was recommended to me by my psychiatric nurse after I was recently diagnosed with my own eating disorder. And I'm always skeptical of self-help books, but I thought this one was really well done. And I mean, it was recommended to me by a psychiatric nurse who deals with this all the time. So in theory, she should know what she's talking about. So the author, Jenny Schaefer, refers to her own experience and her therapist, Tom Rutledge, has a few chapters in there too, and both of them present actionable steps that you can take, um, and they break it down into really like easily manageable, easily managed chunks um, that are things that you can do at home. You don't need anything special, um, although therapy is always recommended. Even if you don't have an eating disorder or a mental illness, therapy is just always recommended. Go to therapy. It's great if you can 
afford it. And Jenny Schaefer repeatedly says throughout this book that this was her experience, but everyone's experience will be a little different. Some of the things that she says might work for you and some others might not, depending on you know what kind of a person you are or how your eating disorder affects you specifically. Um, she compares overcoming an eating disorder to a divorce. One of the first steps that they lay out is to separate your eating disorder from yourself and to name it. Um, and most people tend to go with ED, um, like ED, eating disorder. Uh, so she will often present her eating disorder as like a toxic ex who keeps trying to get back with her. And I think that visualization is something that a lot of people can easily like latch onto. They can easily picture that. So it's a lot easier to wrap your head around. And I just thought it was really well laid out. All of the chapters were short and concise. And like I said, the steps were really clear. And Jenny described her own experience with these steps and what they looked like for her while also presenting some alternatives of how they could look like for other people. If like what exactly worked for her didn't necessarily work for you. And overall, it's just very accessible um, and easy to understand and pretty easy to follow. So if you are struggling with your own eating disorder, I would recommend picking it up. And I will say that I didn't, um, how Jenny described her eating disorder is not exactly how I, how mine works. Um, so, you know, know that going in, it might not be a one for one for you, but it still has still had a lot of really helpful information. And yeah, it's a great first step if you think you might have an eating disorder, um, but you're unable to talk to a psychiatrist, you can always pick this up and see if what you're experiencing aligns with this. And then you, I, I would never recommend anybody self-diagnose, but it will give you more information for uh, in the future when you are hopefully able to find a psychiatrist, you will have like a, a foundation to start on. So yeah, I'd recommend it if you are so inclined. I gave it four out of five stars. Next, I read Long Live the Pumpkin Queen by Shay Earnshaw, which is a YA Halloween fantasy, is how it was described, and I love that so much. <laughs> this story picks up directly after the events of Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas. Um, it's from the point of view of Sally, and Jack Skellington and Sally have just gotten married, and Sally is officially the newly appointed Pumpkin Queen of Halloween Town. But with the spotlight directly on her after a lifetime spent in the shadows, Sally isn't so sure that she's up for the task. But when Sally and Zero discover a mysterious door to a hidden world, they unknowingly set off a chain of events that will put Halloween Town and the whole world in grave danger. And it's up to Sally to find a way to save her home. This book is just so cute. I enjoyed it a lot. I think the characters are handled with so much care, and you can tell that the author really loves the source material, um, as do I, in case you couldn't tell. I tend to give off that vibe. The author mentions in an afterword that she thought that Sally deserved her own story, and I fully agree, and I like that she got this story, and I like this story for her. Um, there was a plot point that I didn't really enjoy, it is kind of a spoiler, so I can't go into it, but if I remember to, I'll leave a review on Goodreads with the spoiler in it, so. But yeah, there is there is a plot point that I didn't enjoy. Uh, I thought I thought just I just thought it was a missed opportunity. So yeah. The one nitpick that I had though is that Sally kept referring to Jack's lips, which always made me laugh because it, he's a skeleton. How does he have lips? Like, in the movie, it's like claymation, so your suspension of disbelief is higher, and you can like see his mouth moving and stuff, but reading it, it's just so silly. <laughs> but if you are as big of a fan of The Nightmare Before Christmas as I am, and as Shay Earnshaw clearly is, I would recommend checking this out. I gave it 3.5 out of 5 stars. Yeah, maybe 4. 3.75 out of 5 stars. <laughs> and the last book that I read in October was Uzumaki by Junji Ito. This is a horror manga about a small town in Japan that is being haunted by a spiral. I never thought I'd be traumatized by snails. 
But here we are! This is pure disturbing body horror. Um, it is very imaginative and the artwork is great. The whole thing really is this spiral into hopelessness and horror. So if that's your thing, then you will love this. I do not usually like body horror. Um, thankfully, I had an idea of what I was getting myself into. Otherwise, I would have been scarred for life. But I still didn't love it. I can, I know this is a very beloved series. And I, I understand why it is, because it is very horrific and disturbing. Um, but I just, I think it's just not, it's just not for me. Body horror, it doesn't do it for me. I'm content to never read anything like this ever again. <laughs> uh, I also have one major problem with this. Um, there was one thing that kept bothering me right from the beginning that just kept taking me right out of it. I couldn't, and I like couldn't enjoy it. And that was, at what point do you just leave the town? Like, at a certain point in the book, the residents do become unable to leave the town because it's just like, like a spiral, it's sucking them in so they like can't leave. But that's not until close to the end. There was a whole motherload of horrific things happening in the town and the people just stayed? Like, not everyone in the town witnessed the truly awful things until it was too late. So they get a pass. But our main character, Kiria, saw a girl she knew get devoured from the inside out by a spiral right in front of her eyes. And she just stayed? I would have been out of there immediately. If my parents don't agree, bye mom and dad. I'm, I'm an emancipated child now. I'm not staying here after one of my classmates got devoured by a spiral coming out of her forehead. <laughs> and not long after that happened, her Kiria's hair grows unnatural curls that begin growing upwards. And like the artwork shows her hair is like two feet tall and just like waving around. Whoa, hello. Waving around like octopus tentacles. And then her hair attacks a person and she still doesn't leave? Why? What is so... What, do you, what is so important in this town? Like, all of your friends keep dying. Why would you stay here? <laughs> also, the snails. The snails? I hate them. Ew, why? Ah! Um, so yeah, this series was definitely not for me. Um, but if you are into disturbing imagery, enjoy. I gave it 3 out of 5 stars. And those are all the books that I read in October. Please feel free to let me know what you thought of these books down in the comments. Let me know if you've read any of them and what you thought of them. And if you'd like to find me elsewhere, you can find me on Instagram at Leia like the Princess, where you can also find my little embroidery and art store, Moon the Cat Creations, or you can go directly to the website at moonlikatcreations.com. Thank you again for watching, and until next time, stay cozy.